Boston Podcast Players is supported by a grant from the Bob Jolly Charitable Trust. Boston Podcast Players. The story thus far. Cast of characters. 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 Empress of Rome. An entity or demon. A run-of-the-mill Polish guy in his 40s. Setting. In a small hut. A long-forgotten era that lives both in the Act past. Act one, scene we one, create the, the world with the stories we tell Act about one, ourselves. Scene because two. Steven, he could Act be anywhere, one, right? Scene Don't three. give up the ship! Cannon fire. Bianca pushes the stop button. The end. Welcome everyone to Boston Podcast Players, Boston's virtual podcast stage for new works by local playwrights. I'm Greg Lamb, the host of the show, and today I'm joined by my guest co-host, Anne Fleming from The Depot, from way out there in the accurately named quiet corner of Hampton, Connecticut. Anne, welcome to our show. Thanks, Greg. Now, before we talk to our feature playwright, Michael Bradford, can you tell everyone a bit about The Depot, your play reading series? Yes. So The Depot began four years ago, and it's a group of people in eastern Connecticut with the occasional friend coming down from Boston or up from New York to read new plays. We do cold readings at a table. The idea is to keep up with what's going on in contemporary theater. At somehow, and I have no idea how, playwrights began to hear about what was going on at the depot. Hmm. So they began asking if they could come for readings. So once in a while, and in fact this summer, all the readings will be with playwrights present. So that's the depot. Yep. Yeah. And if you want to learn more about The Depot, you can go to their website, thedepot.space. Correct. Uh, so The Depot is all one word. Thanks, all right. Greg. So now we're about to hear an excerpt from a play called Fathers and Sons by Michael Bradford, which Anne brought to my attention. And what do you think we should know about the play before listening to the excerpt? Well, one of the things I think we should know about the play is that there are more characters than we're going to see or hear in the scene that we've excerpted. It's a play about four generations of fathers and sons, and the immediate event that precipitates the story in the play is the abduction of four-year-old Stephen, the son of Marcus, who is an Iraq war veteran and a writer. Stephen was abducted while Marcus was supposed to be watching him. His father comes to visit to help him, and we also have a ghost uh, trumpet playing ghost in the play. This, which is the grandfather of Which is Marcus. the grandfather of Marcus. And we should say Bernard. this is an African-American family. It, the family is an African-American family, exactly, and I believe they're in Brooklyn. The scene that we're going to hear is a scene between Marcus and his wife, Yvette. And this is a scene that takes place after Stephen has been abducted. And Yvette is asking Stephen to do whatever it takes to get their son home. So now we'll listen to the excerpt, Fathers and Sons. This city is so small and so big all at the same time. Everybody says that, right? It's the people. It's a whole lot of people. I took the five train into Brooklyn yesterday, the express, because Stephen, he could be anywhere, right? After a while, I forgot which train I was on, so I looked at the map by the door. And it don't really matter what time of the day. A whole sea of people. Maybe I looked lost because a little girl in the seat next to me said, Which train you looking for, miss? Which was no help either. By then, I had forgotten which way I was going. People are always looking at their feet or acting like they're asleep or... What good is a map if you don't know where you want to go? If you don't have a plan? So I turned around and came home. It took me forever to climb these steps. All these people, and I swear, nobody ever looks at you. I felt so heavy. My shoes, my bag, my coat, my keys. Like I just swam across the ocean and crawled out soaking wet. Heavy as a ton of bricks. Not on the street, not on the train, not in this building. Not one person has ever looked at me. So I've decided not to eat for a while. That might help, right? A little hunger makes you... Concentrate. So tell me, how in the world somebody looks at my boy? A little mahogany boy with high cheeks? People don't see that every day. If I saw him coming down the street, I would look at him. What's your favorite color? I don't know. Pick one. Lie if you have to. Then what does it matter? Because sometimes 
A lie is a good thing, sweeter than this truest truth. Don't you tell all these beautiful lies to get the truth when you write? The story is not about reality. It is about truth. Isn't that what you say? Blue. Your favorite time of year? Fall. You remember that mud cloth scarf you wore when I first met you? Of course. You looked like... I don't know. I love the way you looked. We wanted to travel, didn't we? So many places we wanted to go. You remember all the places we wanted to go? If that, why are you asking me? Because I need to tie things down. Don't you want to tie things down? I don't see how this... Yeah. Let's tie it all down. Your least favorite place. Right here. Excuse me? I'm not doing this, all right? You want me to disappear? You want to beat me? Here. Beat me till I disappear. For me, hmm? Do this for me. War. That's the worst place I have ever been. Did you kill anyone? I mean, while you were there in the Gulf. Versus since when I've been home? Well, since you've been home... Stop. All right? Yes, while you were there. You said you never wanted to know. I don't need to hear it if you don't want to say it. That's what you said. Well, things change, don't they? I heard Mr. Schomburg down the hall ask you one afternoon, and I thought, how rude. Mr. Schomburg has numbers on his wrist, Yvette. Mr. Schomburg really didn't want to know if I killed someone, or how many I killed, or, if I, or how I killed them, or anything about me at all. Mr. Schomburg wanted to know something about himself. So what are you asking me? I wanted to ask you this very question the moment I saw you step from the plane. Then why didn't you? Because you said you wanted to come home for this life, for children one day running around your feet, and I needed... No. I wanted you to be the father you always said you couldn't wait to be. Not because I couldn't do it alone, but because I knew we could do it so much better together. And all of that was so much bigger than any one question or answer. But now, I can't help but think about what you did or didn't do because something must happen. Something at the core of who you are. Some door must open that never quite shuts if you've killed somebody. Maybe I was more scared to hear it than you were to say it. I don't know. It's just that now, maybe that would explain this. Maybe that would tie this one thing down for me, Marcus. Explain what? What are we trying to tie down? Something must have changed for you to let something like this happen. No, 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 no. I'm not doing this for you. I didn't let this happen. You think I'm just sitting there watching some idiot walk off with our child? My son? You think, I mean, who the hell? All right. All right. Okay, here it is. I killed people. And every time I pulled the trigger, I emptied the clip, and I didn't always know which ones were mine, or somebody else's, but it didn't really matter, because every time I was scared, and happy as hell, it was them, and not me who was dead, because I wanted this life, and I didn't care what it cost, all right? Is that what you need to know? I thought I'd feel better. I should feel better. Do you? No. But maybe you could do it again. And it would be easier. You could find whoever did this and do it again. You could do that, right? You understand what you're asking me? It could be kind of like something you'd write, yes? With the crazy glow of sunset in the background. We can't do this, Yvette. We already Not doing like this. this. We already doing this. We doing this till Stephen comes through that door. You did this to complete strangers who didn't do anything to you. You did this... You did it for some figment of imagination called Uncle Sam. Who the fuck is he? But you won't do this for Steven? Yvette, that's not what I'm... Yvette, who is that? I don't know who she is. I'm walking through this house and breathing and talking, but this is not me. This is not my life. What you want me to do? I want my baby! I want you to leave out of here and murder everybody you see till you find my baby, Marcus. He is flesh and blood we made, and I'm telling you right now, it is all right to murder the world until he is home with me, with us. That's what I want. That's what I'll do then, huh? Just like that. 
I'll get my coat and hat. I'll take some extra clothes and... Look at them. Look at the people just walking up and down the street, buying groceries, going about their daily business. They have no idea that just above their heads there is nothing but war. Make this right, Marcus. You... You lost our son, and you need to bring him home. Did you hear that? No. The phone. You didn't hear the phone? He already called today. He's not calling again until tomorrow. Maybe it's unplugged or... We never unplugged the phone, vet. Never. You know that. Are you sure? I mean, are you really sure about anything in the world? The man calls every day. You could check the connection. One time. Every day. Why don't you at least check the connection? That would seem to be the very least you could do. Or am I asking too much? Michael Bradford grew up in campus in his family of storytellers. He left the Great Plains to join the Navy and go to the sea. And after 10 years, he finished his bachelor's degree, then earned an MFA at Brooklyn College in playwriting. His plays have been produced throughout North America and Europe, and he is now the director of theater studies at the University of Connecticut and the artistic director of Connecticut Repertory Theater. His theater resume is five pages long. This is a literal statement. Five pages, single spaced. Michael, welcome to Boston Podcast Players. <laughs> Thanks for coming all the way up here to uh, the Boston area. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, let's talk for a moment about the play we just heard, Fathers and Sons. Yeah. Uh, the scene takes place between Marcus, the Iraq War veteran and writer, and his wife, Yvette, in the aftermath of the abduction of their four-year-old son, Stephen, while Marcus was watching him. In the background of this crisis are Marcus's absent father, Leon, and Leon's absent father, Bernard who appears on stage as a trumpet-playing ghost. Bernard to Stephen, we see four generations of fathers and sons. What was your impetus for this play, which I understand you've been working on for quite a while? Mm. Well, sad to say, at the time, I was in the midst of a, a divorce, and it, it was quite amicable as those things go. And my children were young. My daughter was uh, 12. My son was uh, 7. And... Their mother's family um, is from Pittsburgh, and so they were making the move back to Pittsburgh, and I was helping to facilitate that move. But all I could think about was, you know, when I would get in the car and drive back to uh, Connecticut, and I wouldn't be waking up in the morning with my children, you know, under the same roof as as I, which was a a devastating thought for me. And I, I thought about how they would think about it, how they would feel about that. I thought about my own father, um, having been raised by my grandparents and what that meant, what was in my DNA or not in my DNA. You know, it's almost like Oedipus. The more I try to escape my fate, the, the, the more I'm running towards it to some degree. And I thought, ah, is that what's happening to me here? I, I'd like not. Anyway, all those thoughts were in my head and I thought, you know, let me magnify this to the nth degree. What What is that like to have um, literally lost my child? And then what are the conversations and all the machinations that are involved? What does a father do in order to rectify that situation? How far would he go? And that was the impetus to sit down and begin to write the play. And how did you first encounter Michael? I know that when I uh, asked you, because this season I'm asking a co-host of various places of of uh, esteem in the theater community in Boston and all the way out in Connecticut uh, for recommendations of playwrights to feature. Your immediate response is Michael. Uh, so how did you first encounter Michael? Well, I encountered Michael through his reputation well before I met Michael, probably 15, maybe even 20 years ago. I had a friend who wow. was studying playwriting with Michael at uh, the Groton Avery Point campus of the University of Connecticut. So I, I've known about Michael. I have actor friends who were working with Michael on the 24-hour play project. And then I have another friend who, when Michael was on sabbatical, my friend taught some of Michael's classes at the University of Connecticut. So Michael has been sort of not a presence, but he's been someone I've known about for a long time <laughs> and was finally able to meet him 
I, I don't know, we bumped into each other here or there at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy where I used to teach or at events in and around New London. I'd see Michael. And then when I started the depot, I really, I'm, I think I stalked him because <laughs> I, I, wanted, I wanted Michael to bring a play. And so I just kept bothering him. And I don't live very far from the University of Connecticut campus, and there's a coffee shop right across from the building where Michael works. And occasionally I will be in the coffee shop and Michael will come in and, hello, can you please bring a play to the depot? So She did um, not sound like that. <laughs> well, okay, that's nice. Um, but so Michael eventually did bring a, a play to the depot. It's a different play. It's called Root Woman, which is having a production this, uh, this April in Norwich, Connecticut. And it's a thrilling, beautiful play. Mm. So when you asked me who among the playwrights that I know, not that I know thousands of playwrights, but um, I I know playwrights in the area, New England, I'd put it that way at least. And uh, Michael was the first name that came to mind. Oh, nice of you. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. I hope that wasn't too long an know. answer. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to hear that answer too. Because it just seemed like we've known each other for a while. <laughs> Couldn't quite figure out exactly when that happened because that's probably the least important part of the, the thing. She's but, inserting yeah. herself into your memories from the beginning. <laughs> Boom. Exactly, <yeah. laughs> so, and what do you see in this play that we've heard an excerpt of? Well, lots of elements. Uh, Michael does not, I, I don't know every play that Michael has written. I know five plays. But of those plays, I would say that Michael does not always work in a, a linear manner in terms of his storytelling and that Michael is willing to work with surrealistic elements in in his storytelling and I think we definitely find that in Fathers and Sons. Right. There are some other elements that I'd like to ask you about Michael if that's mm -hmm. if that's okay in this play that I I don't know how typical these elements are in your work, or mm -hmm. they're specific to fathers and sons. But one of the first things that really stood out to me in both this play and also Migrations and Root Woman mm -hmm. is mu music mm -hmm. and bringing musicians onto the stage and having live music as part of the fabric of the narrative. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask you what in your head, what is the role of music in your plays? Mm. Well, I think probably like a lot of us who grew up with a lot of music in the house, you know, I, I kind of track my life, my emotional growth through Aretha and, you know, yeah. Miles. And that's just so much a part of how I think about moments, right? The music of that, of that time, of that moment and what it made me feel and how I could escape into that or stealing my father's eight track tapes, you know, to, to take to school and because it was so rebellious, um, you know, shaft in the third grade, you know, people looking at you like, have you lost your mind? It just, it does so much feel like it's woven into my life that it's, it's really easy for me when I sit down to write to think about what is the melody of that moment? What's the, what's the verbal melody of that moment? And what is the literal melody of that, of that moment? And, uh, you know, I, I think Miles Blue and Green is my go-to to write to. You know, I like to have music on when I'm writing. And if I'm in a cafe, I bring the headphones. Because I'm, I'm so emotionalized by it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so bebop jazz, I'm, I'm a fanatic. And so that finds its way in more than anything else. But it's, um, it's just how I think about how people are making it through their lives, basically. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's really <laughs> great. And, and thanks for telling us what you write to, because I, I was wondering if you did, in fact, write yes. to music. Yeah. So Anne did mention that this play is both uh, non-linear in terms of time. Mm -hmm. We have fl flashbacks and flash forwards, or just back and forth in mm -hmm. the timeline, and also non-realistic elements like the ghost character. I don't think mm -hmm. he shows up, and people say, "Ooh, there's a ghost." It's just yeah, a person there to talk to within the family hierarchy who is no longer there, but who's going to mm -hmm. comment on things and talk to us about those elements. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's another element that makes its way into everything, and I wasn't quite clear about that myself until actually this uh, editor uh, called about uh, publishing this particular particular text. And I just feel like there's something for me about the theater that is so much bigger than 
than life, that it should encompass all of all of life. And so I come from a family where the, the, the dead are really still a very much a part of your life, you know, all those, my great-grandmother and grandmother, well, your great-great-grandmother's watching you, would you like to do that with her watching you, you know, all those, <laughs> all those kinds of things, and, and some, you know, just these supernatural things that are operating in the world, and, and, you know, as I grew up, it just felt like those people are still very integral to the way I should see my life and know my life, and because our history is so truncated, you know, as descendants of, of slaves, it just takes on a new added importance to maintain it. My grandmother passed a few years ago, and the only thing she whispered in my ear when I last visited her was, uh, don't forget about me. And so it's just such a powerful element to me, and it seems apropos to theater. It seems apropos to this, this really big, imaginative place that can encompass all of life. And so in this particular play, the, the grandfather, grandfather of Marcus, who's dead, is really only having a conversation with Leon, Leon like his, right. his next son, because it's really his ghost. Do you know what I mean? It's um, when we have those things that we haven't quite worked out and that person passes, how long that lingers in our being, trying to figure out, well, now it's just me trying to work that out. How do I work that? How do I work that out? Um, and Marcus, of course, has never never met him. Um, and this is an issue, I think, in African-American communities that we have to really think about. Like, What is the, the DNA of our history that still lays upon us and affects how we see how we see the world and this kind of disconnect between father to son to grandson to great grandson how difficult those lines are when you know men are thinking about their lives in a certain kind of way which of course goes right back to me and my my son and the situation i found myself in and how do i how do i maintain that you know how do i not let that history which seems to be repeating itself not um how do i navigate that and so the ghosts just seem to be just a bigger element of, of life and i I suppose that's why I'm, there are always ghosts in there somewhere, because it's, it's a big life. Um, and it's not, the night is linear, the night that the father shows up. That's right, that's right. That's linear, and that's kind of tracking time, but it just feels like we remember, we're not thinking about time when we remember. Like, that moment makes me think about this moment. So all of the flashbacks or moments with Yvette. The following who's, memory. You know. Exactly. They, they just happen as they come up in his mind. You know, and then she doesn't actually literally come back into the space until the very end. Until of the, the very end. To the yeah. very end of the play. And it, it, it felt in the writing a little scary because I knew it was not linear and that some people have an expectation of these things to be more linear. And, you know, how is how am I, how's the audience going to track those moments? It was a little scary to me, but I thought it's truthful to me. And I'd rather lean on that and hope for Hope for the best. Michael, I just want to ask you just a follow-up to mm -hmm. the, your statement about the theater being a space that's big enough to encompass mm. all of life. And really, if you bring a ghost on stage, you're really now beyond life, right? Mm -hmm. I was wondering, because there was something about the way Bernard comes on at the beginning of the play mm -hmm. that made me think of old Hamlet. Your play's very different than that play, although arguably that's also a play about fathers mm -hmm. and sons. Uh, I, I'm curious if when you think about bringing in a spirit, what you're trying to do is, is to really investigate the history of African-American families and how those histories can be kept alive and or if there are broader um, conventions in theater that you're drawing on or traditions in theater that you're drawing on? I think somewhat both. I mean, I, I'm not doing anything new, so I know that I'm just, I'm doing what has been done in a conventional way in the theater. But at the same time, I am trying to explore specifically African-American familial history. And I'm feeling as though that's important to me because I think in the African-American community, we and I know I'm speaking generally, but I will, that we're not thinking about what elements of that history are still kind of echoing down through the way we treat each other and the way we think about family. And what is it to have your family sold, you know, um, away? Um, does that just operate in the vacuum of that moment? Does that kind of weave its way into your psychology? And that affects the way you treat people down the line, which, again, creates another echo and so like what are the questions that we sh in the african-american community specifically should be asking ourselves 
about who we are to each other and how we're treating each other and what part of our history is laying on us, you know, like a piece of muslin um, that we're not acknowledging. Um, and so, yeah, I'm specifically thinking about that. And as a man, African-American man, I'm specifically thinking about that particular history. As I said, my grandparents raised me, um, didn't really know my father well, had to take care of him in, in the last few years of his life because I am the eldest son. And we had really wonderful conversations about how he thought about, you know, being a father, which has nothing to do with how I think about being a father, but he had no reservation about having the conversation. Um, and so there was just a level of, oh, this is just how you see the world. Let me investigate that. Let me talk about that. Let me try to understand that. It's not what I want to live, but it's part of my life now, right? And it has affected me. And so let me think about that. I don't have any answers to that. I don't think the play answers those questions, but I do want to talk about it. And I think that that story, as specific as it is, I love that idea, specificity leads to universality. Yeah. And so that that story, although specific to the African-American community, has some conversation, right, for the larger community, the larger humanity. Um, but, you know, I, I think I'm doing both. I love tradition in theater. I love craft in theater. I think as hard as I try to break that mold, <laughs> sometimes I find myself right back in it. And so the question for me is, how can I really bear down on craft? How can I really bear down on some of these traditions and really make them work? Because I used to think about, oh, how do I just destroy that mold? And <laughs> something new, which um, it's not happening. Uh, but how do I make it my own is really what I think about. So I'm, I'm a great lover of craft and tradition. We have over 2,000 years of just in the Western history of, right. of theater. My God, why throw it away? You know, why not use it? So Take a moment to uh, ask about something that just occurred to me that you're situated much more differently than anyone else I've talked to so far, being a head of a theater department at a college, mm -hmm. uh, not only a college, at UConn, and uh, arts director of some of uh, a theater. So what, what do you learn from being in those viewpoints that someone who is only a playwright uh, does not know? Mm. Well, I suppose as a playwright, I always thought um, when either my play was accepted or was not accepted, you know, and I've got plenty of those rejection letters wallpapered in my writing room wow you know it's just something about me you know it's something very particular about my writing or, or they've never met me so that's you know when you're just sad it's, <laughs> it's me but you know i'm thinking oh they didn't read it really well they didn't take the time with it you know they liked my last play they didn't like this play i don't know how much different it is but it was so very kind of narrowly defined on the play and certainly where i sit right now I have so many things to think about as to whether or not we'll do that play. We're doing a, a brand new play uh, called Good Children in the Coming Season that I knew about three years ago and told the writer that I loved three years ago. So when I called this year and said, okay, it's, you're in the season, let's start you know, figuring out the contract. She said, oh, I thought you just forgot about me because I didn't show up in the next season and you said you loved the play. I thought you forgot about me. And I'm saying... Her name's Tracy, Tracy Thorne. I say, Tracy, you have no idea what all the machinations are, you know, to make that happen. There's a lot of balls floating in the air. Some of them artistic, some money, some personnel. <clears throat> For me, you add academics, budget, it's all these things. And so that's what I, what I have learned. You could love it. You could absolutely adore it. And you can't put it in the season at this moment. You know, you might, you might have to wait. Some stars have to line up for that to happen. The, the conversations that you have as a playwright with artistic directors where you're saying, they're telling you how much they love the play and how much they'd like to produce the play, but they're not saying we're going to produce the play. And I can, as a playwright, I'm always thinking, just say what you're going to do. <laughs> we're not going to do. Why not just say it? But I, I know now why they don't just say it because I'm, I'm in the same boat and I'm so guilty on the phone talking to people or at wherever talking to people and and I just try not to even bring it up you know they know I'm looking at the play they know it's a possibility I just try not to bring it up because I hate those conversations as a writer but I know now why the artistic director is doing it because up until the moment that we put the advertisement out we put the flyer out we put it online that we're doing it and we're committed up until that very second something could go left something could go south 
Do you know? And so mm-hmm. you, you just, you, and you don't want to crush people. You don't want to hurt people. You don't want, yes, yes, we're doing it. We're doing it. We're doing it. Oh, sorry. This thing happened and now we can't. This thing <laughs> happened and now we can't. We can't find the right director. We can't find, you know, whatever the case may be. And uh, I never want to make that phone call. And I imagine most other artistic directors don't want to make that that phone call. So that that has humbled me to a great to a great degree. And um, I try not to question those things when I hear them now as a writer <laughs> because I'm like, okay, you have a lot of things to think about. That's a great uh, viewpoint to hear. It is. I had I had wondered if any of your previous guests were were professors and. So yeah. one of my questions, mm-hmm. and then I'd like to get back to this play, but one of my questions is if if you could essentialize like two points that you hope all your playwriting students get by the end of the semester, right, or three points, or, you know, this one, it, you must absolutely take this one away from you. Mm-hmm. Is, what, is there anything like that? And if there is, what are those points? And students, this will be on the final exam. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really big on um, craft. And so I say to my students, um, I tell them that just a quick story that, that Louis Armstrong was interviewed about uh, what he thought about this new thing called bebop. <clears throat> Coltrane and Mingus and, and Monk and he said well hey if you enjoy cacophony then hey you love them because that's really all that is it's just cacophony they don't, they don't really know what they're doing they don't, they don't know how to play and Coltrane was asked about that statement and he said I love Louis and I appreciate him but I play the scales for three hours before I even think about it composing a piece of work and why do I do that because I need to know the scales in my in the marrow of my bones not just at my bones in the marrow of my bones so that I can be in constant conversations even even as I'm traveling on this melody outside of where my people are how do I get back how do I remain in communication I have to know the scales front to back and so I say to the students like in our earlier conversation craft is key right so you better first learn how to write a plot Write a character-driven piece, you know, understand what absurdism is. And so it's not just, I just throw words down on the page and that must be absurd. <laughs> um, you know, so so craft is craft is big and we spend a lot of time on craft. And the second thing is uh, write bigger than you know. That thing about write what you know, it's a, it's a, to me, it's a little bit of a dangerous idiom because people think, oh, I haven't had that experience. I can't write that. Well, do you know what love is? Do you know what hatred is? Do you know what revenge is? Do you know what despair is? Do you know what joy is? Do you know what suffering is? Even where you are at your age. And if you think you know what that is, then create a situation by which you put characters in, in that. It doesn't matter whether you 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 literally whether you literally know that situation or, or not. So just write bigger than you know, you know, because a lot of dorm plays Oh. Into the, into the and I say, if I see another dorm play, I'm going to jump off the second floor. Of the so be big, be big, uh, right? Right, big. What's the worst thing a person can say to another? What's the best thing a person can say to another? Sometimes I love you from one character to another is the worst thing that they can hear. And so don't be, don't be scared to do that. But be, be big. I love that because that's really the mm-hmm. way you imagine the theater, mm-hmm. right? As this space that yes. can contain the multitude exactly. right that is really wonderful yeah. your plays really do seem to me to deal with really big questions <laughs> right and love right and in this in this play fathers and sons the love between Yvette and Marcus which is tested in a way that Thankfully, most people's relationships are not mm. tested. And the question, what's going to happen? I mean, we we don't know. We yeah. know she's gone. We don't know if right. she'll come back. We don't know if Mar- what Marcus will do. We don't know if he'll reconcile with his father. And these are, like, when they happen in our life, I mean, these are the big things that <laughs> we take to our graves, right? Indeed. We so could you talk about some of your themes and the and the way that you work to make sure they're big, they're bigger than you know? Well, not so much in this particular play, but I think just in general, I love I love um, history and I love like big moments in history and how everyday people do or do not survive those those moments. For this particular play, it just felt like 
what just what's a big personal thing to happen? What's a, what's the biggest test that a couple can can deal with? And I think losing a child, a child, you know, dying young is a. Oof, I, I can't even. I don't even want. I don't want to imagine any of it, but I do because I want to write the play. So I can't imagine that. But I thought. I think one step further is you left with one parent and you didn't come back. Mm. And does that other parent say, it's okay, we're going to get through this, I know you didn't do that on purpose, but what happens if that other parent says, oh no, it's your fault, you're on the hook, yeah, yeah, and I'm not letting yeah. you off the hook, right. and I'm going to say it again and again and again, like what are you going to do? You know, and when, yeah, when the incident happens, when the child is lost, it, I don't believe it's gross negligence, it's sort of... Uh, a couple moments of inattention. Mm -hmm. uh, as a parent, I can say I've been guilty of worse. Haven't we all? Right. Haven't exactly. we all? I just yeah. looked in my journal. I was really writing up a storm before we left and took my journal with me and I thought I'll put him on the merry-go-round and I'll just look down for a minute. It was a minute, you know, and, and, he's, and he's gone. And do I love him? Please. You know, like the sun loves the moon. Yes. Right. Do I love you? Yes. Um, how do I how do I navigate this thing that now that this position that I'm, that I'm how far will I go? Will I put that gun in my backpack? Will I will I meet them at the station when the, when when the police said he's arrived? How how far will I go in order to make sure that you are somehow good in the world because I cannot bring him bring him back? I don't have the answers to these questions, and I'm just as surprised myself as to what you know they come to uh, in the play. Uh, but I think. I'm just really fascinated with, yeah, you know, how do we survive love? I mean, how, how does love survive in the midst of these very difficult situations? Um, and if all things are possible, then it is possible. It may not look good. I mean, it may not, you know, the sausage getting made may not look good, you know, but, but it's possible. So let's, let's travel a bit, see what happens. Let me ask that. Well, as you're writing the play and you know that it's going to be based off the incident where a child is lost, mm -hmm. do you know in your had the ending of the play yet, or did it occur to you as you were writing it? It occurred as I was as I was writing. I'm not just as a writer really big on on tying things up at the very at the very end. And so at some point I figured out, well when the detective called at the end of the first act, then I knew that otherwise why call, you know, at two o'clock and why call so right. late at night when he normally calls during the day. So by that moment I, I knew. You know mm -hmm. what what would happen, but it, it took it took me until the end of the first act to, to get there, so I, I wasn't quite sure. And then once right. I knew that he was not going to make it, then that presented some other problems um, that allowed the play to continue to move forward because he, he, that's the end of it, really. That you know his child is is dead. That's really the end of it. But there's some other things to work out. You know, he and his father, and what that means, and then he and his wife, and what that means. And so, yeah, yeah, I knew it at that time. Even as I talk about it now, it's heartbreaking to me. It's just heartbreaking to me that that's... It's, it's a heartbreaking play. But, you know, so some people do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. You know, Lynn Nottage went to... Uh, well, she went to, to Africa for ruin? To, for ruin. She, yeah, I forget which country, but she went, she went to Africa and did the research there on the ground and then ruined, came out of that. Um, I believe she also did uh, the research for Sweat, mm -hmm. um, that she spent some time with factory workers in, in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So when you ask your students to write bigger, when you write bigger, do you trust your intuition or do you do some research? Well, you know, depending on the type of play, I would say... Well, it doesn't really depend on the type of play. Research is, is crucial. Research is, is crucial. And it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be the research of that particular moment. I just think you just, you need to be a reader. Yes. And you need to read, you know, the canon and the classics. You need to see how great writers have pulled apart these emotional landscapes and psychological issues. You, you just need to be a reader. If you're placing it in a particular historical period, what I say to my students is, you, you have got to research your way into the center of that moment and then write from the center out. If you're writing from the outside in, you will never, you won't, you won't get in. You just won't get in. I say that about writing about other cultures and other ethnicities. I say that about writing other historical moments. So you just, you just have to, you have to research your butt off. Now, I hate it. <laughs> 
I love to read, but I hate the research process. You know, I wrote the play on Lorca, and I just, I spent a year reading everything uh, on Lorca, about Lorca, and all of Lorca's stuff, which I love because I love Lorca. Um, but the research just felt like drudgery, and I, but I knew I had to do it. And then you have to wait. You know, it's like spaghetti sauce. You know, you eat it the day you cook it. It's not bad. But three days later, it's like everything is popped open. Everything has done its thing. You eat the spaghetti sauce three days later, and you're like, that's what I cooked. So you got to put it away, you know. And so it's time-consuming. But that would be your advice to the common playwright question of, I am, you know, white, and I want to write this minority character, but I don't want to dive into minefield and get blown up. I'm this and I want to write about not this. I, I would say you, you just have to be brave, but you also have to be smart and you have to do the research, right? Mm -hmm. You have to try to get as close to the center of that as you can. I am never going to get to the center of Spanish culture, but I can get pretty close, you know, and write my way, write my way out. Um, because I know I'm never going to get right up on it because it's, it's not mine. But I, that never stops me. You know, I write women. You know what I mean? Okay. I am never going to get to the center of women. But um, I don't have any problem saying, let me just really have some conversations and do some reading and spend some time and talk to people and then sit down and sit down and write. I think it's, yeah, it's necessary to do. And um, I, I think you, you should write about other cultures. You should write about, you know, other ways of seeing the world. I think you should do that. I'm a big fan of that, yeah. As, as hard as, as it is. <laughs> but I love it. You know, I do, I do love it when I sit down to write and you've forgotten most of what you read and really only the stuff that you need sticks and you can pull it up, you know, like that. Like, I don't need to crack the book once I start writing. Um, that I really enjoy. Like, I felt like I've done my work. I've spent the time. I've tried to understand. I've talked to a lot of people. And now I can just write. I don't have to keep going back to the biography that to try to figure that out. You take it on board Indeed. and and you know what you need yeah. and, and the rest you can just ignore. Hopefully. Yes. Um, the last question I want to ask, because I don't think every play does it and I don't think every playwright does it, mm -hmm. but your characters, um, some of them are just about wisdom. Just, mm. they just, they speak from this position in life. I don't mm -hmm. want to say like, like prophets because they're not prophetic as in, you know, sure. you will all be smited if you don't do what I tell you. But, but they speak with a with uh, from a place of great understanding yeah. of life's verities, if I can put it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and so to me, that's very philosophical. Mm -hmm. um, I was really struck in Fathers and Sons. Leon, Marcus's father, says at one point, every story got a little more to it than what you get in the telling. And it don't matter who's telling it. Um, and Marcus quotes the poet Frank Bedart, what you love is your fate. And um, I mean, when something's quotable, I feel as if I've moved beyond just a story. Mm -hmm. And I've moved into something that really is telling me about life and mm -hmm. how we live life. There's no moral, there's no right. lesson to be learned, but it's, there's, it's deeper and richer. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask you if that just comes out of you <laughs> or if, if, you know, you really want to share with your audience all these great, great observations mm. about, <laughs> about <laughs> our lives. Well, I think, um, how do I answer that? Um, at the time, I don't know what's a, what's a great thing to be said. I just, I just, I just want to try to find that collection of words that gets to the, it gets to the thing. It gets to a certain kind of a, a truth. Like what's the collection of words that are going to get me to that, to that kind of a truth. And because I come to writing, uh, playwriting as a, as, well, I will say a poet because that's what I was mostly writing at the time and who I was reading. So Gwendolyn Brooks and Sonia Sanchez and Alice Walker's early stuff and um, Nella Larson's early poetry and Zora Neale Hurston that, you know, I just so loved their ability to put together a collection of words that made you say, oh, I have known that, but I knew that at this level. They know it at this level. 
um, how did they do that? Like, how did they find that? And so if it's a, like a, if, if it feels like it's a really big moment, I just really like taking my time trying to find that kind of, just a collection of words that really kind of places that, you know, like you're telling stories, Marcus, I'm telling stories, your mother's told stories, each one of them are going to be a little bit different, um, but you're going to get something out of all of them, but never be mistaken that there's more left, you know, there's more left in the head than on the table. Um, like, how do I make you know that? Like, you can't fault me because my story differs from the one you've heard. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. my story has its own validity. Exactly. You get to know me and whatever then you know what might be left out. But my story is, you know, has its own validity. I'm not trying to lie to you. I'm just telling you my story. Um, how do I, how do I get to that? So I'm, I do love that part of writing, trying to find that out. I don't feel stuck when I get to those moments. I just feel like, Oh, I should take a little time here and try to try to get to the core of what that, of what that moment is. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, what stage is fathers and sons at in terms of development? Is it, uh, Fathers and Sons is as developed as it's going to be. Um, the first production, well, the development process was pretty extensive. Um, I was at the Lark. I had two different residencies at the Lark, the Playground and the Playwrights Week with Arthur Culpit and um, Tony Kushner and David Ives and um, Jose Rivera with a collection of six writers just coming in once a week to, to read and talk and to workshop that. And then the Playground, which is a kind of a cold read, but went on its feet with a collection of actors and directors. I then brought it to New London, uh, we, the Hygienic, which is one of our performing venues or exhibition in, uh, places in New London. They were first opening the art park. And Jim Stiffel called and said, would you do a reading of a collection of plays to help us um, inaugurate the art park? And I said, I would love to. And I found some funding and was able to bring the New York folks and the director that I had from New York in. And I commissioned a, a jazz trumpeter to come in as well to create some original music. And so we put them up in New London at the Griffiths House, which is a you know another residency place, and had a great time with it there. ACT in Seattle, a contemporary theater in Seattle, called and um, produced it. I think the following year, we had a nice we had a nice run out there. I got a call from a Chicago theater, a uh, small theater on the South Side. They produced it there, and so it's you know it is. So it's then, ready. <laughs> you know this friend friend of mine who's an editor at this publishing company called and said you know we'd love to get it in, into the into the book. And so it is. It is what it is going to, what it is going to be. So um, I'm not big on sending work out. And so <laughs> if somebody picks it up or my agent sends it somewhere and somebody's ready to do it, it's good. Um, that that's fine with me. I have found it that it is the the scenes with Yvette, which I most particularly enjoy about the play. Mm -hmm. That you know when people do call me, you know it's. A couple of times people have said, hey, can you just kind of line those up a little better? Those scenes with Yvette. <laughs> and I say, no, I can't line those up <laughs> any better, any better. Well, we love the opening of Act 2 where they're just mm -hmm. buying the, 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 the place. That, that, that can, can stay, but the rest, could you just line them up? <laughs> I can't line them up. So, yeah, so speaking um, of people calling you, uh, part of the hope of this podcast is that people out there listening will get in touch with our future playwrights. Well, and, that's always a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> so my question I have to ask is, what yeah. is the phone call or email you would like to receive from someone listening to this podcast? Um, if you go online and see my university um, stuff, that's that's great. So michael.bradford at uconn.edu, and uh, my phone number is um, 860-486-1621. That's perfectly fine. Okay. Mary Harden and Curtis is my agent in New York, and you can go online and get their information. And I see you can uh, get a collection of your work called Olives and Blood mm -hmm. uh, and other plays. And it looks, um, uh, how many plays are in there? Are four plays. Four full lengths? Yeah, four plays. Fathers and Sons is published on its own by Broadway Play Publishing as well. And uh, Willie's Cut and Shine, another play, is published by Broadway Play Publishing. So there's a, a couple pieces out there to, to pick up. Yeah. And All in Blood is by Dr. Osiro Plays Publisher. Yes. By. Yeah. You have a... No, I just wanted to make sure that we did mention this. Um, <laughs> and Michael's play, Root Woman, is also going to be published uh, next spring, yeah. I think you told me. Next spring. Same so, with Dr. Cicero Press. Oh, it's Dr. Cicero Press. Oh, Dr. So, Cicero. Okay. so that will be coming out as well. So Indeed. we have a number. Yeah. Indeed. Well, Michael and Anne, thank you for trekking all those way up from thank you. 
can I get in, uh, well, very sparse snow, but <laughs> so, nonetheless, <laughs> it's a long way. Uh, I'm very proud to have you on our podcast. It's my pleasure. It's my great pleasure. We'll sign off for now. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, Greg. Fathers and Sons was written by Michael Bradford. Marcus Goodwater was played by Nikolai Fernandez. Yvette Goodwater was played by Angela Hunt. The excerpt was recorded by Eric Lawson at the University of Connecticut Theatre Department. Follow us on Twitter at Boss Podplay and on Facebook. Please rate us on iTunes or your podcast player of choice. You can support us on Patreon at Boss Podplay. Our theme was composed by Thomas Deus, thomasdeusmusic.com. Additional music by bensound.com. Other than yourself, do you know of a Boston area playwright who you'd like to be featured on the show? Let us know at bosspodplay at gmail.com.